Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to Bottom Line. I think you're going to think that we're just ho hosting South Africans on this show now, but, uh, but that's not the case. We've had Ilanka, my sister, Lindy, and Hopley with her uh, amazing ministry, and now two guys, Harry and Bossa from Cape Town, South Africa, from Unashamedly Ethical and Tribe. We're going to get into a lot of these initiatives, but really Unashamedly Ethical, which just even saying it, is an amazing thing to say. It's an amazing concept. So welcome, guys, to the bottom line. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. How long have you been in the States for this trip? I know you were here in June, but a week now or how long? Yeah, yeah we week. came in last week. We were here for a for a conference where uh, a lot of the young people from across the globe, .orgs, .coms, and .govs came together at Dallas Baptist University. And uh, the whole idea there was is to charge strategies per region across the globe for changing the trajectory of christianity for the globe so yeah. it was a uh, yeah 150 people in one space 70 internationals it was a, a great time yeah it's good and dbu what a campus though I oh mean, yeah yeah it's a compound it's, it's a special place right yeah i know it is for sure and, and great facilities mm. um listen just to dive right in it's not right that you're in the country for three days and then you go watch a ut football game mm. and then you watch history being made last night i think right yeah watch the judge hit it out the park the judge hit his well sought after home run to break a record right yeah. i mean the stadium went nuts i mean you you think it's yankee stadium yeah it's it's um americans it's amazing i mean they're such a love for sport mm -hmm. but particularly they're crazy in austin yeah look i'm not a fan of the burnt orange you got it on your wrist <laughs> I, i'm just not okay but the, the climate and the atmosphere there is pr pretty electric. Uh, yeah, well, they share the same colors as our brand. So, you know, I, know. I suppose we had to we had to support there. And uh, You have to support. I love the color God <laughs> made. <laughs> but that team. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I got nothing against you. Team, I've but. never been in a place where 100,000 people come together and cannons going off and uh, live cattle being paraded around. It was, uh, it was a culture. No, it's an experience. A culture experience. It's an experience. You know, Becca, who's in studio here, and uh, she went to Baylor, yeah. uh, Baylor University, and, and also Baylor Bears proud football, very proud football. And uh, it's, it's cultural here. I mean, mm. if you go to an SEC school, it's as much about the football even if you're a girl or a non-football player, it's about, well, is the school's football program good? Because it's culture. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just what it is. So now I'm glad you've experienced some American culture. Mm. Uh, but let's dive into the other side of culture. Talk to me about unashamedly ethical. Mm. Help our listeners understand and viewers understand. Just what is the concept of this nonprofit out of Cape Town, South Africa? A... a, a a birth from Graham Power and and all the amazing work that you know mm. uh, precedes what this has become. But help me un help us understand mm. a little bit of, about unashamedly ethical. Yeah, so I hope your your audience can drink from the fire hose, so to speak, because we it's are, all the, uh, I host this show. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we're going to dive into it. So I think around uh, two thousand, you know, Graham Power has a a radical turn in his life uh, in terms of just God reaching reaching down from heaven and um, having a moment where he installs this, this vision in him on 2 Chronicles 7.14. And he says, if my people will uh, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, um, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So Graham clearly sees this vision about people praying together. And um, after that, you know, there's, there's turning from this wicked way. So first, first task, uh, Graham is like, okay, we got to get people to pray and repent, and uh, you know, get to that place of just God first. And um, he, he sets up a stadium for people to come to to pray together. And you know, at that point in time, you know, bombs are going off in Cape Town. It's rough. Um, that first uh, event is held. You know, you got a stadium sold out, fifty thousand plus people, and you're praying together. You've got overflows in churches. Amazing moment in in history. And since that day, not a single bomb going off in Cape Town. Um, so God just in that moment just takes us and catalyzes it into rolling across into other cities, other towns. You've got uh, countries, and in a ten year span, you've got people praying in two hundred twenty nations, hosting global days of prayer. And just a beautiful moment, um, reconciliation happening, a lot of healing happening in, in certain parts, and just um, God moving mightily. And at that time, um, you know, God says to Graham, well, it's the next phase, and it's, you know, we need to look at this turning from your wicked ways. 
And Graham sets up with with a with a bunch of people, trusted people that across the continent has come together to pray to say, well, what does it look like when you turn from your wicked ways? And one of the things they really just see um, historically and biblically is the leadership matters. Yeah, absolutely. And so they come up with this catchphrase, transforming leaders, transforming nations. And they say, how do you get a nation to transform? How do you get a nation to turn from their wicked ways? You've got to speak to the leaders. And those leaders have to commit to a set of values because beliefs might be able to separate us but mm -hmm. values pulls us together yeah. and so can we come around these 10 values can we come around these 10 sets of things and if you if you look on our website unashamedlyethical.com you'll see what those 10 values are and those values have been through the fire you know we've tested in them every scenario and have found that people say yes yes this is what we strive for as an unashamedly ethical culture and so rolling that out in 10 years we saw a lot of people say yes to the dress and very quickly found there's a lot of challenges when you're speaking yeah. about being unashamedly ethical. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we saw things like a spectrum uh, coming about. So we saw unashamedly unethical. We saw on the, well, on, on I, the yeah, far left. We're, we're <coughs> on the far left. We're unashamedly unethical, unethical. at the moment. Right. <laughs> and then you've got uh, ashamedly unethical. And then you've got uh, ashamedly unethical. And then you've got unashamedly ethical. And then we found now recently an a, a, a even higher part of that is courageously ethical. When are you out there? When are you taking it on? You're not just unashamedly, but you're courageous. On the you're front bold. line. You're yeah. in the front line, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that time, we build out this network in 144 nations, footprint across the vast area. We've got one head office doing support across the world multiple ambassadors, you know, advocating, educating, communicating on ethics. But that network is saying to us, man, we need muscle. We, we, we're, we're struggling to take this mm -hmm. stand. We, we've got three places. So it's, it's creating a platform for ethical organizations to flourish. And you do that through multiple ways, you know. So things like the narrative, like giving people models of people living unashamed ethical had to be something because people are saying, I'm just so surrounded by the lie. I'm so surrounded by the corrupt. What does it look like when someone gets this right? And the second part to this was equipping and empowering people because they were saying, I don't know what ethics is. I don't know what right and wrong is. I, what is righteousness? What's self-righteousness? Um, so we had to do a lot of work in the equipping space. We had to get a lot of partnerships and people going, that. hey, we've been around the block a few times and we know what we're talking about when it comes to the equipping part. Empowering, you know, getting judges, getting advocates, getting people to say, hey, we'll back you when, when, we, when you get into the fight of it, what's happening in that space. And so that was really encouraging for us. And the third part was connecting people because when you step out of corruption, when you step out of those spaces. You need the community. You need yeah. the community. Yeah. And we need to help create those ecosystems, right? Yeah. So that was really sort of a strong next phase for us to the process. But then the other part of this is, what are we doing about our future? You know, you got people setting their ways. You've got businesses, organizations setting their ways. How, how difficult is it to swing them? That's the long game often. But we could look, look at the future and we could say, well, what about the youth? So what are they being taught in schools? What are they being taught about ethics and values in schools? And we really started playing to that space. And that's when Tribe was birthed about two, three years ago. We said we need to start operating the schools. We need to start looking at what are our children being taught around ethics and values. And so Greg Madungwa comes along and he, and he, he operates in that space and just helps us to, to challenge the narrative around schools and around, you know, families, around, you know, it starts in the home. But, you know, what's happening at school and what's the influence the kids are getting there and you know, we're operating, uh, operating in social media space because that's where the kids spend so much of their time. So if they're getting a, a lies being propagated to them, what are we doing about propagating the truth? Yeah. And we saw that media is such a powerful tool. And for us, we started saying, okay, we need to be a narrative that they can follow. If the mental health, depression, bullying is things that they're seeing versus what what we want to propose, um, you know, what is truth, what is what is family to them? What is, um, how do I live my life? Um, you know, my dad might be a bad role model at that time. So what could the future look like? And what am I going to inherit if I continue along these lines? So Tribe is really um, stepping into the space of saying we want to promote ethics, values, and clean living into the youth. 
And it's just been a tremendous momentum builder for us. And I think out of that was an evolution also for Global Day of Prayer. We said prayer is really foundational to what we do in terms yeah. of strategy. And keeping that foundation and saying, okay, well, we need to trans uh, do a, a, a step on. We need to move forward and take Global Day of Prayer and turn it into Global Voice of Prayer. And Global Voice of Prayer has become a platform for various networks of prayer to say, what is God saying to us collectively around the globe? And it's been such a fantastic community of sharing God's collective voice and also a place where we could have campaigns around repentance, around reconciliation, uh, coming to the table, you know, right? So you're welcome here. You know, there's so often this the perception around Christianity and uh, about, you know, speaking our judgment over various things. But what about the love? What yeah, about saying we, we, come to and, the table? And at times, often a separatist kind of a movement. Yeah. But I suppose of on tribe, right? Your your background is in finance, right? Yeah. Um, uh, banking, um, managing funds. So your interaction, how do you play into this? Uh, and and what is a current initiative? What is a core focus for you? So there's two major focuses. The one sits within Tribe in activating young people to take responsibility for the environments that they that they live in. So we live in a situation where we have 64% youth unemployment in our country. Now, there's a, a very low likelihood that that country won't blow up if 64% of the youth don't have jobs that they can gravitate towards. So Tribe started a, a process of entering schools and then entrepreneurially mm -hmm. teaching and activating kids in an authentic and ethical manner do business. Yeah. So we would give them an amount Which of money. Which ultimately, so, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but that is literally don't give a man a fish, but teach him how to fish. And, Absolutely. And, and through economic viability and an economic stability is how you bring stability to a culture. Because now there's hope in, in small business and small enterprise. So yeah. I, I think it's a model that has to be replicated around the globe. I think it should be fundamental to any any education department for that yeah. matter is to mm. is because it's abdicated completely mm. kids kids you know kids graduate from high school and so so great you had ec you know economics maybe as a subject or yeah. or you know accounting it, mm. it's nothing if there's not a practical application so you guys have a practical i think greg told me yeah, yeah. ethical entrepreneurship there's yeah. a practical application right that you guys teach it. well that practical application gives us what all of us want and that's agency so a child living in a, in a, in a township, living in a, in a shack, does not feel that he or she has agency. Now, if you put money in their hands and show them how to take agency and control of that money, and then being able to look after their families, or maybe save enough money to be able to go to a university that might not have access, they might not have access to, that gives people agency, that, that teaches them how to fish, and then also how to feed other people. What what has been your experience? Because we drove as I drove in from the airport, uh, and we went for a really nice breakfast, which is always so good. Looking at Table Mountain and it's yeah. just picturesque. And you were there, yeah, late to the party, but you showed up. <laughs> you came <laughs> exactly. But we drove past a school that I think is one of the schools, right? Yeah, Calling Academy, Calling on the left side of the road. And uh, what has been your experience when you when you empower a child like that in in just talk to me a little bit about what you eat because I, I want people to understand no matter where you are at a, at a tribal and a visceral level, right granular bottom line, when you impact a child at that level and you empower them and there is agency, mm -hmm. what, what do you see what happens? How does it impact a community or a family? Uh, you know, what, what, what is your so I'm going to hand over to, to uh, Harry here. He's closer to the, to the action on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the reality of that moment was, um, I don't know if you've ever been at a place where you've taught someone to fish. Yeah. The, of the, the, the change yeah. mm -hmm. in their demeanor, the, the way they move from victim to conqueror. It's what I was achiever. hoping. You, I was hoping you would, you would talk about mm -hmm. transitioning from being the victim. And we've mm -hmm. got a whole population worldwide that is trapped in victim. Oh, right? I mean, and, and you take someone and you say, well, I'm not going to accept the truth that you believe about yourself. I'm going to show you the truth that is you are good. 
you are a person that can achieve in life. You've, there's talents and gifts being placed in you that has been placed in you in, in our context through God. And God is saying there's been, there's been a situation that's been placed around you that is saying this is a lie. And we bring in the truth about you saying, well, what happens when I give you $10? Um, and what happens when when we expose the, the the hidden talents in you that no one else has, has done you through through fatherlessness through poor role models through socioeconomic environments, and a child goes and says, okay, cool. So I know what to do with the ten dollars now. I'm going to go out to market. They test it, and what's interesting in the first month, they usually fail. Right? They spend they, it. They, they struggle, right? Yeah. And then but you come back around them and say, we're going to help you fail forward. And we're going to just create a safe space for you to make a mistake. And that's okay. And then the child goes, okay, well, let me try this again. And let me try with what they've said. I've tried my way and, it, and it's my old way. And now what's the new way? Mm-hmm. What's this redemptive way? And they come back within three months, they're making $150. You know, six months, they're making 500 Within three years, they're paying their first year's university tuition. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean. I, I, I say these things. Some things in life are taught. And they have to be taught. Mm. Yeah. And then also, I believe our culture has become so visual, they have to physically see it. There was a time culture where, where of course, pre, pre-entertainment pre media there is today, you had to read it. You know, you could physically couldn't see it. There was theater in the back of wagons and et cetera, et cetera. But now it's, it's you have to see it. So some of it's taught, but a lot of it is caught. Mm. Mm. Right? And, and the, 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 the caught side of it is, I'm going to take the 10 bucks and go do it my way. Probably buy a pair of sneakers or something mm-hmm. or do something, right? And then go, wait, wait a minute. The other guy, it's working for him and they catch it. It's mm-hmm. like they catch a vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to put it, put them in the environment. Yeah, you've got to create that. And right? create a safe space to fail. Yeah. To fail forward. I love that. You know, When I played professional sport, the greatest coaches I ever played for were the ones that, like a Jake White, um, was amazing at this in South Africa and in here in the US many coaches the coach that in the locker room said make big mistakes mm-hmm. mm, that's good make them big play 100% every play and you're gonna make mistakes mm. make mm. them big you have safety you won't lose your job versus the coach and I had these coaches too that said if you make a mistake your job's on the line and all of a sudden you play at 60% because mm-hmm. you play safe yeah, because you, you you play like you, you could go through life without making mistakes, which is impossible. Now, on that note, I want to jump into a commercial real, real quick and come back and pick that up. Listen, guys, Patriot Mobile is the only Christian conservative cell phone provider in the United States. Uh, when you spend money with Patriot Mobile, you know they're not going to repurpose your hard-earned dollar and fund Planned Parenthood or fund abortions. They're actually, based on this conversation, ethically aligned with your values. And believe what you believe, and you don't have to go dig. They're out in the front. They've gone to the border with us. They physically have stood at that Rio Grande with us and helped rescue children. We've seen them feed the farmers, the ranchers that have been decimated on the border. And again, this coming December, Glenn Story and his team is going to go back down to the border with us and fight for life. So why don't you check out Patriot Mobile? You're going to get phenomenal service. If you're a veteran, they're going to take extra good care of you. And mention the bottom line online when you go to their website or dial 972-PATRIOT and mention the bottom line and you're going to get free activation. Check out Glenn and his team. When we talk about creating space and environment, right? I met Greg on your team. Hmm. He walked in the room and I was like, dude, I don't care what you're doing in this organization. Just just smile. Because mm. that guy just has, he, he oozes this presence mm. of just, and I can just, it's almost like God handpicked him for African communities mm. and just put him in there. And they'll just, I can just see them just open up. Yeah. And the walls come down. Because I think so much of life, you know, pain, hurt, disappointment, discouragement, hope deferred, particularly in like African communities mm. um, where the child can't see a way out. Yeah. It's not, it's not evident. They mm. can't see a way out in mm. their community. In the U.S., if you live in Dallas and we have food deserts in Dallas, you can go to Oak Cliff and they can still at any given time in the day see something that can make them aspire. Yeah. 
they can still i mean it's it's hard to be in the u.s somewhere and i've been some places native american reservations where you just can't see hope because mm. it's not evident right but it's it's few and far between you can still see africa however there's a lot of places where in their in their world which which could be you know a 20 kilometer radius they can't find hope mm. Mm. They, mm. they physically can't see it so they can't even dream mm. and for me i think children worldwide i think we need to we need to wake up the dream again we need to encourage that they can dream and and i'm just mm. completely um guessing here but i think some of the work tribe is doing is it's waking up potential it's waking up the dream mm. yeah, and it's to some degree you know greg uh grows up in a in a home without a, a biological father and a community surrounds himself around him and that impact on him meant that he doesn't repeat the cycle mm-hmm. you know he's to some degree fathering a next generation a, a fatherless generation and i know that's quite big words but I know that Greg takes it seriously. He's like, the next generation matters. Leadership matters. Me modeling that which is absent matters. A hundred percent. Yeah. So that, that that has been, you know, just the the absolute calling on his life. And, and he's so dedicated to it. You know, I asked Greg, I was sitting there, I don't know if you remember, but I asked him a question and he said, mm, Yaku, I don't have an answer for you for that. Right. And not that I was like stumping him, mm. but it's a real question. It's just something we dive into here. And the reason I think he doesn't have the answer is you just don't have the organizations that run those kind of, of, of mm. subset polling, right? Mm. Yeah. But in the U.S., I asked him about fatherlessness, the rate of fatherlessness, the number, right? Mm. And in the U.S., 80% of all incarcerated individuals, 80% were raised fatherless, 80%. Wow. And now those 80% that are in prison have now left their children mm. fatherless. Mm. And, and, and so we say their generation, it's 90% fatherless. You can't. I was raised without a dad. The, the, the obstacles that Satan is able to place in a child's life, even from a belief system, right? It, it is by nature and by default that a child would pick up the victim card mm. and become the victim. Yeah. And I think once you become the victim in your mind, we're seeing adults in this country. I can show you adults in the NFL. Okay, think about this for a second. Here's this kid from, let's say, Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, these are going to be fighting words, boys. You (laughs) went to a Tennessee game. I'm going to talk about the tide, roll tide, (laughs) Bama. Okay, he's raised in Birmingham, Alabama. He's raised with nothing, no dad, uncles in jail, prison, but the kid's gifted. He can run and jump. Okay, he's hoping his future is I can get out of this life. Yeah. Okay. Maybe soccer in Africa, but yeah. He gets out. He goes through high school. He signs a college scholarship. He goes to college. He's never taught how to manage money, Mm -hmm. ever, not one time. No role model. No role model. He's never really taught at school how to really build something for himself. It's just graduate, Mm. sign a football contract. Mm. He goes to varsity. He plays four years of, of college football. He doesn't pay for a single thing in his life. Wherever he walks, the meals are ready. They swipe a meal card. He gets on a bus. He travels to high life. He's got 100,000 people in a stadium chanting his name. Think of it, the dysfunction. Okay. Mm-hmm. All the while, he's a victim. He's a victim. He's a mm-hmm. victim. And now he signs a signing bonus to the NFL of $5 million, $10 million. And his education in the NFL, and I played in the league, his education in the NFL for financial stability is guess how much half a day three and a half hour session where they're going to now take this kid that has no concept and they're going to teach him how to manage five million dollars okay with all the belief systems and the victim mentality now you got guys in the nfl that has 30 million dollar contracts and they speak like they're victims Mm -hmm. they speak about oppression they speak about the lack of opportunity Mm -hmm. and i go how powerful is deception mm. that the guy can be driving in a Bugatti, living in a three million dollar mansion, going, "I'm a victim." Mm. It's insane. And can it, I share a story please, on role modeling? Please do. So, so I think yeah. I, the answer there might not be fatherhood, because a lot of us, you know, don't don't have natural fathers. But maybe the the answer there is role modeling. And if you have a father and a mother, how how do father we as figure. parents a father figure? So just as an example of of when the chips are down, what God calls us to in role modeling. 
So we had last year in June, July, we had the most atrocious riots in South Africa. Yeah, it's bad. It was a part of, of our country, beautiful part of our country called KwaZulu Natal, that uh, because of political instigation and uh, the vulnerability of a community into which that instigation was put, there was um, there was just people burnt stuff that was looting. People lost their lives. It was it was horrific. And I remember working from home at that point in time, and my oldest son, he was 23 at the time, running up to me and say, Dad, 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 you know, did you see on social media what's happening? There's people rioting, there's people just you know, burning shops. And, and, and he asked me, so what are we going to do? Now, he's 23, so I know, I know that it was like a rhetorical question. At 23, you, you have the answer. You just want a, a door to give the answer to. So I said, what do you think we should be doing? And he said, Dad, we, we need to protect ourselves because that could wash into our city and, you know, we, we need to look after ourselves. And my answer to him was that if more people start burning and taking up arms and trying to protect ourselves, the result will be anarchy. So what is a, what is a counter spirit that we can bring into this situation? So he, he went, OK, so Dad, you tell me what we're going to do. So I said, my what I think we should be doing, and this is a follow-up of um, of the ministries that Harry was talking about, was in that time we formed an entity called Heal Our Land. Just the the final point to the the, the Chronicles scripture, and we decided to fight violence with generosity. And what we had to do there was we had to protect the people on the ground from it escalating into food riots. Because the, the production lines and the food lines into that area was decimated. Mm. And people came together and raised money, got a hundred or a thousand tons of food onto interlink trucks, shipped it into that area with a with an app based on WhatsApp, hearing from the for the far flung regions what their needs were, what they needed, how many people were situated in what areas, what food parcels they required shipping those food parcels under security forces to them to 52,000 people in two weeks. Now, my son needed an answer to what do we do when the chips are down? Mm -hmm. And the immediate answer was, let's protect ourselves. And in that situation, God called Christian business people around a, a solution where we, we brought a counter spirit to, yeah. to the situation. And that counter spirit fought violence with generosity, and the nth degree of planning of that violence with the nth degree of planning of generosity. Because people, many times, they, they give, they fly helicopters in, and they drop food in a place that doesn't need it and goes rotten. So the, the stewardship of the financial resources that we've got. Now, my son, that is 23, that is now 24, learned something of a counter spirit. But many times we um, we just we go with the crowd, we go with fear. But as as business people and as nonprofit people, if we if we understand that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but it is the tree of life, it is the the planting of trees, the looking after trees, it is the gathering people around my shade under my tree, that is a counter spirit that our society that our world requires. That's the type of fatherhood and motherhood that we that we need in this country. And and that does not have to come through a biological father. Now, when there is a biological yeah. father in a child's life, please, biological dad, step into that space. But yes. but we but we can model that. We can father the fatherless through through an example. And there's so much biblical precedent for what you're talking about what comes to mind you know something in, in the u.s and this is not really it's not accurate but it is kind of what we've become in our in our judicial system mm -hmm. so u.s law has really become case law right and it's mm -hmm. but it wasn't written for case law it was written for the law to be the law in this particular instance okay. but now what they're doing is they'll go well brown versus you know kane in 1985 Set the president. A, a, a judge ruled so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sets the precedent. Well, yeah. yes and no. It's different time, and so it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't, but yet it's become that. Mm. It has, right? Mm. Well, in the spirit of precedent, well, then let's look at the Bible as precedent mm. for what mm. you just said. And there is incredible precedent of, of Jesus 
walking into the most violent crowd who came to kill him mm. and say, let's meet a need. Mm. Let's serve a need. Mm. But, but Rabbi, there's so many. Can we get you on a boat? And he goes, no. How about we feed him? Mm. How, about, how about we minister to him? Hey, let's heal the sick. Mm. Let's, and so that counter spirit, I think, is a lost conversation mm. in the church. Mm. Uh, if you think of COVID, right? And South Africa was, was hit really hard, not with COVID, but your lockdown protocols were insane. Mm. I mean, you had extended very, very harsh lockdown protocols. You're sitting in Texas. We didn't. My family didn't feel COVID whatsoever. We never wore a mask. We were outside. We played outside every day because I refused to to bow to anything other than God. We were we were we were wise, but you had harsh lockdowns. Mm. If you look at lockdown, and I want to try, I want to ask you a question about this. Yeah. If we say that Jesus is the healer, Rafa, and we say technically the church is a hospital, in fact, not a place for the healthy, but a place for the sick. Okay. If we say that. 12 disciples stopped Jesus and said, you cannot touch that man. He's a leper. Drive him out of the city. And he said, no, get behind me. Do you have another tunic? Stuck his hand into the leper's body and healed him, right? Mm. If that's the guy we say we serve Mm. by this name Christian, Mm. if in fact that's what we do, right? Then we close the hospital in the time when the world needed the hospital the most Mm -hmm. out of fear. Mm. We closed the doors of the churches globally, right? When people were sick. And what you're saying to me is a counter spirit looks at a riot and says, let's go in. Mm. Let's go into the right versus your son's first inclination. Let's fortify, shore Mm. up, defend ourselves. No, a firefighter goes into the fire. Mm. You know, they charge in. And I think that is when you're talking about unashamedly ethical, the first time it's like, no, go into business, Mm. Mm. go into the community, go into commerce and go change the culture with a set of values and pull people. Is is that a fair assessment? I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, you earlier when we spoke offline spoke about uh, tools, you know, tool can be used for good or, or evil. Uh, and, and you got to look at this from that perspective to know that in in the case of unashamedly ethical, you know, people put a lot of things in front of the media. Why can't I use the social media as a tool for good? Why can't I share your story on my platforms? Mm-hmm. Why can't I share this journey of generosity uh, with others instead of just propagating, oh, look how they're rioting and looting. Oh, we should take up arms and, you know, we should kill all of them. Hey, that guy that's running around there, He's hurt, mm. okay, and you want to perpetuate that. So his son's maybe running right behind him, and now you take him out. What's the son seeing? You're setting up a whole generation of hurt. And by that, please don't hear me say that, you know, pain uh, or, 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 uh, or, or or the, the fact that people shouldn't defend themselves because we, we saw people, we had military guys that went about it in a very calm way and said, hey, this this area is, is, is governed by a community policing forum, and is your policing forum constitutional? Great. Then you take up arms. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, you stand here. Gentlemen, you stand Correct. there. So you can't, you can't in the it's absence not malicia, of safety. It's, yeah. it's not anarchy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't in the absence of safety go ahead and do these things that we no. do. Sa- safety is the foundation from which we can flourish. So safety is so important in that sense. And I think to your point around uh, COVID and fear, uh, yeah, don't get me wrong. Let's let let's protect ourselves, right? Let's be safe. But fear took over. Fear uh, fear was the narrative. Yes, mm-hmm. and that was not the narrative that I subscribed to. And I was like, come on, wh- where's the hope, right? Fear became a god. Yeah, and and what we did see, what was the positive? Crisis creates opportunity. So some of the churches did lower their walls. Those ones that's so high that nobody can come in. Yes. Hey, we believe in this, and therefore you're not welcome. The walls came down and they said, hey, I'm in need. The other guy said, I'm in need. Let's do something together. Let's work together. We had over 300 pastors going right behind those food parcels and go and do community um, like uh, counseling Mm. to say, hey, why are you hurting? Why did you take up arms? Why did you go and loot? Um, I'm angry about X, Y, and Z. We de-escalated. We had to feed, right? Because what do you do if someone's stomach's empty and now you want to tell them? You meet a knee. Right. Mm. And then... The counseling afterwards came and made sure, hey, 
we're hearing the deeper need we're hearing that philippa my wife philippa says boss of she says um it is impossible to influence or impact something you don't love mm. Mm. can't mm. so to come from the outside and shout solution mm. albeit the right solution, mm. which is so easy for us sometimes with experience in our logical mind and 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 um, um, being intellectually honest to say, I've got the answer. Mm. Mm. I may even have the experience. I've got the answer. Mm. But to throw that as a brick over a wall at somebody and say, this is what you should be doing, they'll never pick it up. They'll mm. never adopt it. They'll never catch it. Mm. If it's not, if it's not, I'm going to share something with you because I love you enough that I don't want you to loot. I don't want you to set up a generational curse on your family. I don't want your son to see a father behave this way, you know? And so how do you navigate in that environment? And that was contentious. Look, mm -hmm. we had a crazy environment here. I mean, Chaz, Shop, Portland, Oregon. Yeah. It's, mm. it's, it's, trust me, it was bad, 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 bad. I know Kyle Rittenhouse personally. And it was, it was a bad situation here. People died and it was mm. unnecessary, completely unnecessary. But how do you navigate um, in unashamedly ethical when you go into corporations? And I think there's 7,000 or so corporations mm. that have joined. And I want to tell people how they can join or, or, or how they can learn more about you. Mm. Uh, Becca, if you can pull up the website for me. How do you navigate the space of correcting but doing so in love? You know, and, and this is the space of meeting an organization and either saying, well, you don't line up with our value system mm. or you do. Or can we guide you as to how you could become an ethical corporation so you can be part of this, the landscape? How do you navigate that? So I'll, I'll maybe just uh, take the, the answer into a, a commercial sense. Um, and the, the one step that we are in the process of taking is um, correcting the business ethic of corporate South Africa. So when I say correcting the business e ethic of corporate South Africa, let, let's put it more biblically, redeeming risk appetite okay. for, for corporates. Because the, if the approach is I, I'm doing business and the only thing that I need to do is I need to look after my shareholders. And if I look after my shareholders, I am a good steward of, of this company. And we truly believe that going after profit at the expense of society, at the expense of uh, the, the stakeholders around you, um, will have devastating effects, even further effects in South Africa and the rest of the globe for that matter, under the guise of being a good steward of the financial resources that I've been given. So we Im we've now embarked on a process and we had a, an amazing conference down in South Africa about two weeks ago under the, the tutelage of um, a, a thought process that is called economics of mutuality, where the whole thesis there is not only maximizing profit, but how can we solve the biggest problems in our areas of influence in our markets, making a lot of profit but not at the expense of the situation or the environment or the sector that we're operating in. And it's a purpose-driven approach of my purpose. For example, I ran a, an investment management company and we built it from scratch and started in the global financial crisis because God called us to go there. And he led us to say, what are the three biggest things in your environment that needs fixing and needs an asset or investment manager to fix it? And the first one was, people are not saving. So the net, the, the, the savings rate in South Africa is below zero. And what we did there is we created products for people that don't have the money to pay for advisors or don't have access to those products. We built them and we delivered that, those products to them cheaply. So that's an example yeah. of a purpose-driven business. Absolutely. And then there's a, there's a $100 billion dollar funding deficit and infrastructure every year on the continent of Africa. So our second purpose was to bring capital into Africa to fund infrastructure. So in unashamedly ethical, in a values-based capitalistic in society, it is redeeming financial capital for God's purposes. God did not intend corporates to make profit at the expense of everybody else. No. 
God did not intend countries to make profit at the expense of everybody else. I mean, company, the word comes from, from the Latin, cum panis, which means breaking bread. It means breaking bread in society, in relationship, and caring for the people around you, planting a tree, a tree of life, and sharing the fruits, sharing the shade. So it is a, it's a fundamentally different approach to doing business that we believe is part of being unashamedly ethical. It's not only not being corrupt, it is stewarding financial resources in accordance to scripture and what, what God's intended purposes of it is. And I'd say understanding identity. And, and that yeah. we, look, we're in a global identity crisis. What is the identity of this corporation? I could even take a big company like Coca-Cola, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The number one brand other than the Bible. There's no other brand distributed more than Coca-Cola. And you know in Africa, you can the kid's going to have two things, a cell phone and Coca-Cola. Coca right? That, that's just a fact. He could mm. not have shoes on his body, mm. but he's going to have a cell phone and Coca-Cola. So what is the purpose of Coca-Cola? And then, and, and, you know, and well, we've got shareholders and we're trading in Fortune 500 company and we stock exchange and they go, no, that's not, that's just what you do. It's not your purpose. And mm. I think now is the time where it doesn't mean don't make profits. Actually, it means be very profitable, but, but apply that and, and align it with that organization's call from God. Yeah. So doing that, though, we talked offline about identifying the men and women in corporations yeah. that have caught the vision, that can then distribute that insight. Walk us through that, and then yeah. also walk us through the website, if yeah. you don't mind. Becca's got it pulled up on cool. how people can discover and, and just... Tell me more about that. Well, it's so exciting when Borsov talks because, you know, you got to ask what, what does unashamedly ethical do? But I, I mean, up until a couple of months ago, Borsov wasn't a part of unashamed ethical formally. And the reason is he heard what's going on here and we heard what he's busy with and you go, but this aligns. Yeah. So Borsov is the quintessential, the model, you know, where you're going, okay, well, here's redemptive business, here's kingdom business talking. And we're saying, well, unashamedly ethical it has a it has a foundation of commitments and we're going to get into that now but i think the reality is what do we do well we need to create a platform for boss of story to be heard right because it's influenced other banks and the work that he does will reach a certain point but then does it does it reach the philippines does it reach south america and does it transform south america then because there's a banker that heard his story and then boom right yeah. so we've had those conversations and creating a space for those platforms where boss of story is heard is such a key part for us so media advocacy and youth is probably the part where we have the best uh, attraction in terms of what we do but it's founded and us all agreeing to these 10 commitments so if you if you click uh, on 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 what we do right and uh and i'm going to ask you to, to to scroll down there for a second um so we, we we spoke about us creating a platform equipping and empowering right and connecting if you go if you go down you know you can see what we're standing for honesty transparency communal courage transformation and care and i'm going to ask you to scroll just a little bit up from that the other way um but I think, you know, we, we, we've got all these components that, that tell people, you know, what can we do for you? But I think initially it comes down to the commitment piece. So I'm going to ask you to scroll all the way to the top again. And if you go to the membership piece, yeah, then, you'll, then we'll, we'll scroll down to the bottom. Um, and I think the point is, we firstly are looking for commitment, right? Mm -hmm. So when when you sign up to Unashamed Ethical, it's a commitment you make to, to, to live according to a certain lifestyle. Then you're joining this network and you're remaining accountable because we often forget the accountability piece. So I'm going to let you click on, let's, let's use business bottom right as a uh, as a, as a as an example so if you click on it it'll pop up and tell you what you're doing so i think firstly you spoke about you know we're not coming to attack and we're not ca coming guns blazing and so if you look at the first part it says as a business or an organization we strive to commit and i think it's important we're not saying commit today you know because sometimes some of these processes means then someone goes to jail today you know what are you going to do to potentially turn around which you've currently doing wrong yeah you got to weed the garden it takes time actually it takes time and then you got to replant because you because know, it's, it's not an overnight snap of the finger but also we are not perfect absolutely the one that was perfected will come again but we are a pro we are in process 100 percent perfected and if government has given us a sandbox to play these yeah. are the rules these are the laws now you've got people playing within that but we still we're still socially broken 
We're still socioeconomically and spiritually broken. I've said this before. You don't need to change the rules of society. You can do so much damage. Yeah. Let's take rugby or football. Within the laws of football, within the laws of rugby, within the rules, you can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Right? You don't even need to move the rules. So societally, I mean, there's so much space. Yeah. To, to even run a company unethically and be very profitable and have shareholders smile, but honestly, eternally, yeah. it is a net zero. Yeah. Game. Your compliance office would be signing off everything that needs to be done. Correct. But yeah. you could still be very unethical and yeah. you could still yeah. do I, damage I'm, to business. Exactly. I mean, I've seen some corrupt individuals give $10 million to a church. Do we say no to that money? Yeah, it's, so it's, no, yeah. this yeah. is the catch. So you've got play in the sandbox. Right, yeah. you're complying, you're ticking all the yeah. boxes, or you're living holier than now, and then you've got out of the sandbox guys. And we're going, well, if government's created these two sandboxes in and out of the sandbox, then where's the third one? And the third one is creating a culture of values and ethics within your corporation, right? Yeah, and so, so run through some of yeah. those with us. So, we're talking about you know, the first one is quite self explanatory to be honest and ethical in all our dealings, but I think. As we go through them, you'll see some of them is really just, hey, that, that's, that's obvious. But I think for me, we're looking at uh, transparency number three to provide all stakeholders with timely, accessible, and accurate information. Big challenge in Africa, South America, other parts of the world is saying, do I have access to the information that tell me whether or not I should partner with you? Right. So companies, when they acquire, are asking risk questions. Can they answer that when companies have a loophole to say, I don't have to disclose all of this to you. I don't have to disclose to you that our culture here is actually one of backbiting and very competitive to the point where we cancel each other. Like, where is that being shown, right? But a place like this where we're saying, hey, we're agreeing to these values um, to negotiate contracts with the utmost integrity. Hey, you're, you're, you're signing up to big things there, paying your taxes, honoring your creditors. The last two is the part where I believe why we have Boss Off and we have Heal Our Land and Tribe and Global Voice of Prayer and, and other initiatives and even speaking to you today say to remember the poor by investing generously and sacrificially in the broader community and then 10 to collaborate with our peers to impact our community and nation. Collaboration is key. Generosity but it's always peer to peer, key. right? Peer yeah. to peer is where you make the greatest impact. And yeah, you we are about, better together. You talked about Boss's story. So for another funny, and I've got many, many friends in this town in Dallas, Texas, who are su super senior financial advisors in this country, whether it's J.P. Morgan, Morgan, Morgan Stanley, whoever, right? Yeah. And peer to peer is always where the magic happens. Mm. You know, when it's a financial advisor to a financial advisor, or it's an athlete to an athlete, or a tennis player to a tennis player. You know, or, or a teacher to a teacher because there's a natural understanding that that person knows my world. Mm. Mm -hmm. That person deals with my pain points. Yeah, I don't have to explain my world to that person, right? Does yeah. it really relate? Does, would mm. it really translate from an athlete to a businessman? The answer typically is yes. Yeah. But there's a barrier up that goes down when it's peer to peer and that's why it's so important. Yeah. But I, I, I know the last two, I agree with you, but I want to go to number four. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, bribery. Uh, mm -hmm. And sorry, but um, uh, number two, mm. think about number two and our culture today. Okay. <laughs> I want to read this to provide efficient, economic and effective products and services in an impartial manner. Okay. Partiality has become a tool mm -hmm. to divide mm. and it's by design and governments are pressing a Although they talk about, uh, you know, equality and equity in this country, particularly, right? They're actually driving a partial narrative. Mm -hmm. Which, when you make a statement like Black Lives Matter, when you make a statement like, you know, um, taking a sector of society and just broad stroke because of a political affiliation, no matter what, saying they're these kind of people, you're creating a partial culture. Mm -hmm. And when you start saying that, um, you know, you 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 can't operate your business based on your moral code. We now have nonprofits in this country who have received some government assistance that's told to remove their statement of faith from their website, or they will no longer receive, you know, funding. Mm -hmm. now, so I, I think number two is more important Good. than than, than, in your, yeah. than the people in our culture here. Yeah, super important, you know, and not driving from a go government partiality because if you look, it's divide and conquer, right? And mm. that's Satan's ploy. Mm. It's divide and conquer. But there's, um, I mean, there's, there's, 
legislation or practices that uh, in banking is called redlining. So mm-hmm. there, there's certain areas that we, we won't lend to. Um, there's certain economies that we won't lend to because under uh, our risk appetites or our risk management, it is being bad stewards of the financial capital that we were uh, given. But in God's economy and in unashamed ethical, it's asking the question, just check your risk appetites. Yeah. So check your risk appetite as to whether um, the market that you are staying away from, the reason why you're st- staying away from it is because you are intentionally impoverishing it as opposed to redeeming it for Christ. Mm-hmm. I've mm. just uh, finished a, a study that, that asked this question. Why does socioeconomic inequality, and I looked at South Africa, one of the, the most unequal societies in the world, why does it just persist? And then what would activate somebody to do something about it? So it was the, the first um, um, psychological study that was done in the world around it. So it, it took psychological matrices to answer that question. And what became clear out of the study was the way that we look at each other, and I would suggest that we look at each other in the globe, we only have two categories. So we talk about impartial, if you talk about bifurcation, or you talk about these polarized worlds that we create. We look at each other and we say, I look at you and I say, you are entitled because uh, you didn't get what you wanted and you know whatever policies around the world, um, you are of a particular race or your particular country. And I look at you and say, you want what I have. You are entitled. You didn't work for it. So that was the one category that came out. And the other category is you look at me and you say, I am enriched. I became rich at your expense, whether it is a country or a person or a, or a subsector. And those two worlds in South Africa, definitely, and I would submit globally, are so entrenched yeah, that's the only way that we can look at each other. And it's so far apart that all the efforts that we've done through governments or nonprofits in trying to build a bridge between these two worlds have failed because of the, the tension, because of the, 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 the distance of these two worlds together. But the amazing thing that I think Unashamedly Ethical does exceptionally well, and there are so many businesses that I found across the globe that do this, is instead of trying to build a bridge between the two, they started planting things, businesses, ministries, and opportunities in the middle of those two worlds, allowing those two worlds to gravitate towards a business or a ministry or a solution, not lose their identity or wherever they came from, then migrate back, and then creating a new community in the middle of these two worlds. But Bostov, isn't that leading by example, though? Yeah. Isn't that just preaching the solution, what I was talking about earlier? Yeah. I'm going to send you the solution. Sure, okay, the solution is correct, but but it's a tit-for-tat scenario, yeah. especially in this country, yeah. with those two, so the, the entitlement mm. or the victim mentality versus the, oh, you're enriched on, on my back. I mean, we sat in a meeting where, where a, a, a state representative in this state said, all the land was stolen. Sure. An absolute, in a number one factually inaccurate statement, but it breeds yeah. a narrative and a culture. Narrative. It breeds hatred, yeah. right? And so, and so what you're saying is we have the solutions. Let's go model it mm. in neither of these two worlds. Let's go can create an environment where we model it and it will draw people to it. Mm. You know? and, and that's, and, but the, I, there is really no other way, I think. It requires strong leadership. Yeah. It I was re- about to say that, though, because look at South Africa. You had a swing 1994. I was a senior in high school. I think I'm a little old. I don't know how old you are, boss, but I was a senior in high school in 94. I am your senior, unfortunately. Okay. Slightly. Well, I honor my seniors. <laughs> but but if you look at that transition and you look at South Africa today and say, okay, so 28 years now of the new government, mm. 28 years. It's a long time, mm. okay? 28 years is a long time. Um, is it any better? Is it truly any better? Okay, so you could say, okay, so apartheid was was gotten rid of, but I would argue there's reverse racism. I would argue, you know, so so still at the end of the day, it is leadership and the sets of morals, values, and standards of leadership modeling mm-hmm. for its people, you know, what what the right way is and if leadership is corrupt it doesn't matter which party has it mm. whether it's the anc or or and, and the democrats or the republicans if leadership is not bringing real true solutions 
uh, Steve Jobs said this. They asked Steve Jobs, uh, you know, they said, so Steve, you're getting to the music business when he launched the, the, the iPod, right? Because no, no, we're not a technology company. Well, then you're a computer company. We're not a computer, Apple computers. We're not a computer company. We're just a company that solves problems. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we, we will be relevant mm. because we solve problems, right? It's funny enough, Elon said the same thing. When they asked him, he said, so you're a car company. And he goes, no, we're not a car company. You're a battery company because we're solving problems. Mm. Mm. We're identifying problems in communities. Yes. And we bring a solution and you will be relevant. Yeah. yeah. They will gravitate towards you. Mm. Yeah, I think the big thing is, and, uh, and maybe I'll close with this, is just unashamedly ethical is invisible. If Bosov doesn't exist, you know, living out those values every day, making it physical, what we believe, what we see as the values, you know, w- what do we do? And the reality is just we have to partner with people living that out and bringing him to a place of saying, hey, bring that story. You're going to inspire someone you're struggling so much with a problem. And when we get that right, then we're winning. But that's the thing. If, if, if unashamedly ethical doesn't exist, even though it's invisible, then he and this don't come to each other at the middle point. And so creating that platform for ethical organizations and people to flourish is such a key part of what we're saying. Because the, the cancer of corruption, uh, we can throw money down that bottomless pit as, as long as we want. Yeah, if yeah. we don't have the proactive and the reactive, mm-hmm. I don't know. Where can people find you? And we've got I've got some things planned for you this week in Dallas. So yeah. unashamedlyethical.com. Yeah. And if it's an organization, is there a method where they can say, hey, we want to raise our hand. We'd love to be part of this community. Yeah. And it takes community. It's accountability. And and when you look at another business, even if it's in another country. Yeah. And let's say you're in the, I don't know, let's say you're a laundromat. Yeah. Right? In Dallas, Texas. And hey, there's a laundromat in Brazil. Mm. I mean, it, it inspires people to see, well, there's someone else of my business type, my business sector yeah. that's in this. There's another financial advisor. And surely if he can do it, I can do it. And mm. it's that whole, yeah. which is why, you know, Nike invests in Tiger Woods. It's like every young black kid says, I can play golf too. Mm. Yeah. Maybe a sport my culture never played, but darn it, I think I can do it. You no, know? And so good. we should do that through ethical business practices. So yeah. Is this the best place? Unashamedlyethical.com. I think if you want to understand, you know, our commitment to values and ethics, um, this is a good place to start. And we've got resources available. You'll see there's a resources tab, books to read in the subject, and maybe just saying to yourself, hey, I, I don't know enough about this. This is the place to get equipped. This is the place to understand our foundation. And then if you're saying, I want to take a few next steps, you know, sign the commitment, you know, say that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live this out. If you want to get part of the ecosystem, then I say there's two different places that we also need to look at, and that's our uebusiness.net site. Can you pull that up uh, yeah. real quick, uh, Becca, as we close? So we've just launched uebusiness.net 2.0, and this is where you search for a business in a specific area. So you're going to say, look, uh, this industry and this area. and It's like and a directory. A directory, right? And you're going to find people that are like-minded. You're going to find people yeah. that you can engage with. Hey, hey, you're, you're in this industry. I've got this service. You've got this service. Let's work together. Or you're an individual saying, I want to support ethical business. This is the place to come, right? And so what's fantastic about this, we are also helping businesses. So we're not just saying, hey, he's a directory, but at the... We, we, we're giving you an ethics consultant when you sign up, you know, to help you navigate because we're problem solvers, right? So sure. in, your, in your expression of unashamed ethical, you'll have different problems and we might have access to someone that's sort of... Well, the already. want to and the how to are exactly. two different worlds, right? A guy may want to, but now how? That's how do exactly. I do this, boss? Yeah. So, so through this program, this membership program, we've, we've really just asking businesses to sign up and be empowered. And I think in terms of our community, we're living on social media, right? So Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, through through all of those, we're running our campaigns. And three times a year, we're running different campaigns. At the beginning of the year, we do a mental health in business campaign called Mind Your Business, which talks about the impact your mind has on your business. When you're in survival mode, how are you thinking? When you're in success mode, what are you thinking? When you're in significant mode, how are you thinking? The second part, legacy leadership. Legacy leadership speaking about not leading for the now, but leading for the future. And what are you leaving behind? It's a great series. And if you go into our social media, you'll get all the videos, YouTube. You can go and watch old series on these. And then the last one we're currently busy with is blood money. What is the effect of corruption? Because we want to sweep it under the rug. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about the bad mistakes we've made and the repercussions there. But then we also do a redemptive on that. So what about moving from blood money to, let's say, you know, 
money that makes a difference. Yeah. You know, it's redemptive versus this, this economics of mutuality. But we have to talk about the effects of corruption because we tend to want to look away from it. Yeah. It's, it's just so devastating. But yeah, people are suffering and we need to highlight that. But then we need to talk about, okay, what's the antidote? And the antidote is kingdom business. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you, Apostle and Harry, unashamedly ethical. And, and everybody back home in South Africa that I've met, the, 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 the tribe within tribe and Greg and Gary and everybody and mm. um, our prayers, particularly now also for Graham. Yeah. Power. And for those watching, pray for Graham, a founder, a, a, a man of God that God birthed a, an incredible vision into. Mm. And we speak blessing over you guys in your journeys here and forward, see how we can collaborate. But for people watching, uh, check out Unashamedly Ethical, especially for the business owners out there. And, and if you're a father, why not just pull the website up and just discuss these concepts yeah, with good. your children? Let's just start birthing um, an ethical society, but we have to do it by modeling it, right? So thank you guys for modeling it. God Thanks, bless Eric. you. Appreciate you. Very much. Talk to you again next time. Thanks.